first thing I'm going to do is give you a very, very brief history, my history, so that you understand where I come from. I'm originally from upstate New York. Growing up, I wanted to be an artist, and so in high school, in my sophomore year, I was taking art courses. My art teacher saw something in me, apparently. Where was that? What time? That was in Clifton Park, New York, just north of Albany. Oh. So my art teacher saw something in me, took a couple of pictures of my work, sent it off to a friend of his who worked at a very um, prestigious arts high school in Manhattan that was also a boarding facility, which there was a very famous movie and television show based on. <laughs> they uh, decided to do whatever they saw, and they contacted my great aunt and uncle, who were my guardians, and my great aunt and uncle, and said, we're giving her a full scholarship, and my great aunt and uncle said, no, you're not. Artists starve, thank you very much, and hung up the phone. <laughs> Pulled me out of all my art classes, put me in business classes, and uh, fortunately my art teacher was a wonderful man, and he said anytime you have free periods, if I have an art class coming, you know, going on, just to come in and sit in, I just won't count you. And uh, otherwise, if the art room is open, I'll leave it unlocked for you and you can go in and work in there. So I had to do it on the slide. Then uh, I was working for the family business. When I got out of there, I said, you know, I've always worked for food, so I went to culinary arts. Getting on to having a family, I went, holy cow, this is 70 hours a week. Either I'm not going to have children or I'll be paying somebody to raise my children, and I didn't like either option. So I decided to get out of the culinary arts. And I started once again doing art pieces. And at this point, I had moved from New York to Los Angeles. And I found this really great old man who, who was a rep, and he repped mostly commercial artists, and I started to work with him, and things started to build fairly well, and I was happy, and I started to have a family, and this was good, and uh, he used to call me Young Sheldon, and then he died. And I no longer had somebody to rep, and I started spending a bit more time with my kids. And in 1995, I actually went to work for a marketing company doing graphic arts. So I was kind of applying myself as an artist, but in a very commercial level. Now, while I was working at that company, I started learning every aspect of marketing. So this was 20 years ago. And then in 97, I moved up to Seattle, where uh, my ex-husband and I uh, worked together on marketing during the week. And then I started doing catering on the weekends and doing an odd art piece here and there for people. So I kept myself really busy and was also homeschooling my kids. Seven years ago, my daughter wanted to come down here for a program that she wanted to get involved in. When I came down here, um, I had divorced her dad. I came down here and I heard a familiar name and lo and behold, it was the guy I had worked for at the marketing company who was a good friend of mine in Los Angeles. And we got back together, or we got together, not even back together, we got together, got married, and I've been here for the last seven years. And as Jerry said, he is a poet um, and a, a very well-known one. And, uh, you know, through that, I've been able to get even further back into the arts since I got here seven years ago. I've worked with downtown um, city manager. Uh, I've worked with the city of Clearwater to produce seven different events, um, you know, fairly successful events. Last two years, we've had to spend a lot of time up in New York handling family. And up in New York, of course, we're out to all these readings and everything else that's happening culturally, and it's really wonderful. And my husband's a feature here and a feature there. We're traveling kind of all over the Northeast while he features, and we're taking care of stuff with his family. And when we got back, we arrived back in Clearwater and went, oh, that's right. There's no art established in Clearwater proper. That's right. Okay, so we need to do something about that. And that was a year ago when we got back here, so I started to reach out to landlords that I knew and talk to the city and talk to various different people. And, and uh, I said, that's it. We need to have, one of our greatest disappointments was with all the events we put on. People come to the event, then they go away, and you never see them again. <coughs> you know, or maybe you catch them on your next event. But there's, there was no permanent home for the arts. And so um, I sat down and negotiated a, a lease on a property, which was a really good lease from a landlord who's very supportive of the arts. He actually has space upstairs. A few rooms left. There are only 175 a month, which some artists are moving into, which is really nice. He would love to have it all filled up with artists as other businesses move out. Um, and I signed the lease, and the city has been very supportive. And uh, I immediately got this rush in of artists. But I wanted to make sure because there are so many different choices that people have. Um, you know, I was already doing research, so I already knew what some of the options were. I knew what barriers people had run into. And that's what I wanted to go over everyone with everyone tonight. Not, there is not, I think, one option for every artist. I don't think it's a one-size-fits-all. 
I think the chartist, it depends on how much time you have, how much time you want to be able to put in, how much do you want to learn about the business side. Um, the most successful artists that I know are the people who have taken the time to learn the business side and actually, and I think that Jerry can probably attest to this, you'll spend much more time on the business side of your art than you will on the art side of your art if you're going to be successful and make money at it and really make a career out of it. As much as we'd love to just go sit in a studio and create, 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 and lock ourselves away and never ever do anything else, there's the reality of the marketing side of it. So there are some options where you don't do so much of that marketing on these. So I figured we just kind of take them one by one. And everybody's got different experiences. And there are other pros and cons that we didn't list, but I just tried to list the majority. Because this was already three pages long, and I didn't want to write a novel for everybody. So, um, and some people have had positive experiences, and some people have had negative. So the first one that I looked at was a gallery. The galleries are going through an evolution right now. And one of the things that I found out myself personally, also with the artists that I dealt with, and even with the new artists coming into this, to the art center, um, is that there's two things happening. Some galleries are raising their percentages. One artist who's been successful as an artist, making his living as an artist 100% of the time, you know, doing his paintings and selling them, was really ticked off when the gallery that he was working with recently said, we're raising our percentage to 60%. Then he started to go out and check this out, and some of them are going even higher than that. And he turned around to the last gallery he went to, and they said they wanted 70% commission. And they said, well, you don't have to lift a finger. We do everything. He said, great, so why don't you do everything and just paint it, too? Sure. Um, I'm not doing that. And he left. You know, 50% is fairly standard. Not that it makes anybody happy, but when you go into a professional gallery that is actually going to market your work, send out the press releases, and do all the work to try to put your name out there and establish you as an artist or expand your career as an artist or whatnot, 50% is pretty normal. So, um, but 50% still hurts, especially in a market where art isn't selling for thousands upon thousands of dollars, you know. We're not in Manhattan, we're not in Los Angeles, and when you have to give up 50% of a piece that, you know, some artists don't mind. They're very used to it. So um, so with a gallery, you have that. You, but you have, quote unquote, no risk to you. But then they've done another thing with, with galleries. More and more galleries are going into becoming vanity galleries. Or depending on whether they're a really good ethical gallery or they're not a very good ethical gallery, they're doing what they're doing is they're having you pay to have your artwork on the walls. Some of them are still screening artists. Some of them are not charging an exorbitant amount. Some of them actually don't have a bad deal. But this is where this is going to be great with the attorneys coming in. It's funny because Linda contacted me and asked to see my contract with the artists and because before she would send an artist to me. And apparently she must have liked the contract because she sent one of her Hispanic artists to me from her, her gallery, which was terrific. Um, but it's one of the things that you have to really, really be careful of because unfortunately, with any place where you're signing a contract, you really want to make sure of what you're signing. And it, and it certainly does not hurt to have good, sound legal advice. Some people can actually look through the contract, review it with you, and make sure that you're not signing your life away. Because in some of these cases, you are. Your artwork's on their walls, you're contracted, you can't take the art out. If you sell the piece yourself, they still take the commission, you know, et cetera. Um, but vanity galleries, too, some of these that are popping up, they don't look at the art that's going up on the walls. So you may have your art, which could be excellent, hanging right next to somebody who, you know, you know, threw a spitball at a piece of paper and stuck it up and said, that's art. It doesn't really matter. They're not qualifying the art. They're just putting anything up on the walls. Which, unfortunately, as much as we'd like to say as artists that we should just be able to create what we want, we also have that public image. And the public image of a gallery is that the pieces are not very good and that they're not perfect. So when your art is in one of these galleries, you have to take into consideration what else is up on the walls. Only because if the public opinion mm -hmm. is that the art in there is just whatever somebody wants to throw out <coughs> there, then the public opinion of you will also go down. It doesn't matter how good your art is because it's going to be judged on the business that it's sitting in as well. So, and how professional those fellow artists are. So, in looking at a gallery, you really want to make sure that you look at the contract, see what you're getting into, are you able to take your work out, or are you not, how long are you contracted for, you know, how much 
fees are they going to take? What are you getting for that? Because you can't just assume that they're going to do all that marketing for you just because you're paying them a commission. Um, and with a vanity gallery, really make sure that they care about your work because some of these people, they get a space, they rent out the wall space, the art goes up, and they don't have to do anything <coughs> because their rent's paid, their payroll's paid. They don't care if your art sells or not. There's no incentive. And when you have a traditional gallery, there's an incentive. So if they don't sell your work, they don't get paid anything. So, but there's a shift in that. And the excuse that's being, and I, I have to say, I'm sorry, that's an excuse. The excuse that's being given for that is that, well, art isn't selling as well now. So we can't afford to just work on commission anymore, so now we're going to charge you rent. But I think that it's actually the gallery's job to help educate you as an artist to make sure that your work is priced properly. And, you know, giving you the tools to make sure that your art will actually sell. So, Shelly, right. I wanted to throw something in. Yes. There was a one point before we had this building and we were shopping Scott's work uh, to go in galleries and in interviewing the artists that were in the said galleries that we were considering, what we learned was that they were accepting the work, they were signing the agreement, the exclusive contract that this artist would only be represented by this gallery, but then the gallery controlled whether the art was shown or not. Mm -hmm. How often the art was shown <coughs> and where the art was shown. And so we chose not to go that route. route. We chose to go a different route uh, because we didn't feel comfortable tying up artwork that we couldn't control whether it was on the wall and if it wasn't on the wall, could we take it someplace else? So that's a real good question to check with somebody. And I don't know if that's the way it still was still is. This was about five, six years ago, but that was just our experience. Yeah, it's never an evolving thing. And then, like I said, more galleries are going to pay to hang your, your art on the wall. So, but still, some of those, again, they can, yeah. You know. But on the other side of the coin, if they can get your artwork selling at three to $5,000 rather than 500 to 100, then that 50% right. commission is well worth the price. Exactly. So, rather than having it just hang there and it has to sell itself, yeah, it can be worth paying the commission, too. So um, so then after galleries, I put down art shows. Now, I know artists who are very, yes? One other question on galleries. Do you have any experience with co-op type galleries where the artists actually lease the space, a group of artists? They may that, have. That actually, we actually are going to go over that. Yeah, we'll okay. go over co-ops a little bit more, too, because mine actually isn't properly a co-op. It's a little bit different. Um, and then I know we talked about it, you know, saying it was a co-op, but there's a little bit of a twist on that. But we're going to go over co-op spaces too, because there are pros and cons to that, and we'll go over that. Um, art shows, I know, you know, a number of artists who do really well. Those artists who do really well at the shows do this, according to what they've told me. They spend about three months out of the year creating art. They spend the next nine months running the show circuit and working their butts off, and they own RVs or trailers because it's much cheaper than paying the hotel fees. They own all of their own equipment. So some of them have RVs, small RVs, and then they tow behind that their trailer with everything that they need to set up. Their pro panels, their tents, etc. Because leasing the tents and everything and leasing the equipment for shows costs a lot of money. So then you're having to give the show money every single time to set your booth up for you. So they come in and they set everything up and a lot of times they'll buy a setup and think it's great and then they hate it and it doesn't work well and things are blowing over or whatnot and then they get rid of that and they go into the next setup. And I have one artist friend of mine who's looking at, she just got her, her third setup, now she's looking at her fourth setup because that one's driving her crazy too. <clears throat> so there's, you know, the pros, well, you're setting your own prices and you're kind of working on your own schedule but it really depends on which show you sign up for, whether you're doing individual shows and whether or not you even get accepted to those because you have to submit to each of those, or whether you're going on one of the tours where you're signing up with one of the big art companies that tours all over the place, and then you have to follow that tour, and then they will specify that you can only drop out of so many shows before you're kicked out completely. So you can't just, you can't select it. So there's one of them where when you sign for the period of time that they tour and they tour for seven months, you can't miss more than three shows or you're out of the circuit. So, because they expect to have full shows and they don't want empty spaces and everything else. And it's very much a business for them to just go from place to place to place to place. Um, one of the interesting things that I've seen at shows is um, 
I have one friend who sells pieces that are in the thousands, and she actually sells her pieces. She's a sculptor. I have other friends who've done it who are who do you know two dimensional artwork. Who the best sellers that they have are prints that are around ninety five dollars, and they'll sell those all night and day, but their originals don't sell. I don't know what's your experience been because you guys do some shows. Yeah, we've been doing shows for about eight or nine years, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I used to show my canvases, I bring about 50 canvases I could hang up on all my walls, and paper prints. And then we started getting the bigger shows where they wouldn't allow paper prints. And then I found that uh, when I didn't have paper prints, I actually sold more canvases. <coughs> so it's kind of hard because I had one show where I sold, you know, about $1,100 worth of paper prints and no canvases. So, you know, I felt like I had to have them, but then some of these bigger shows, then I sold more canvas without having the prints. What was the average price on your canvases that sell? Um, I don't know, $600? For us, Go one ahead. of the big things about show, once upon a time you could do a show and you covered the cost of the show and you made money. And then the years went on and you started just to cover the cost of the show and you made money after the show. And now, more or less, what happens is you do the show and you sell, and maybe you cover the cost of the show, maybe you don't, but you collect names and then you work those names. And then over time, for Scott's work, sometimes people need to see it, and then it's two to three years that they make their buying decision. So the joy of having done the shows for seven to eight years is that we have regular people who say, oh, I saw you in Ann Arbor four years ago. I've painted. I'm now ready for the art. Um, the plus of doing the shows is that you're face to face with your audience and you can ask questions. Do you like this? Would you like it if it were blue? Would you rather it be horizontal? You can choose whether you listen to them and whether you do it or not. But if your job is selling something that somebody wants to buy, then that kind of information is actually quite useful. Yeah. No, that's good. That gets again into the business side of things and the fact that it's taking you time to, to build that up. You yes. have to be willing to talk to people. You cannot be the artist that sits there and looks in their phone the entire time. Though they sell, I know plenty of artists that don't talk to people and they go home with tens of thousands of dollars after a show. I know lots of artists, even today, that don't talk to people, but their work tends to be a bit more mainstream. And um, there's, I don't know, maybe they have real nice smelling floor. <laughs> there's, sure, there's something. How many people here do shows? Are there people here who, who do the White Tan Art Festivals? So you know what I'm saying. There's, as opposed to us, big shock. I'll talk to everybody who walks by. Oh, yeah. yeah, if I don't talk to people, they have no idea what they're seeing. <laughs> exactly. So I'm out there talking. Yeah. And they enjoy yeah. that. They love <coughs> talking to the artists and hearing your story. They do. Yeah, you were going to say. Yeah, there was one artist who was. Um, doing very very well every single show he went to and uh, he invited me to his studio and I saw how he operated and one of the things that he does is his wife makes appointments for him all day long at the show I mean, they've been doing it for you know 30 years so they have a, a list of all the people in that area and she'll call all of them and make appointments throughout the day so every hour he's seeing somebody else who's interested in buying artwork and most artists uh, don't do that they haven't been doing it long enough or they don't bother to collect names but uh, I have a, a show coming up next week in West Palm Beach, and I have about 65 names of people in that area from doing past shows, and I'm going to be on the phone and sending emails and really marketing the heck out of it to try and get more people coming to see me specifically and consider in advance of, of buying one of my pieces. So I think that's a, that's a huge, you know, makes a huge difference. Yeah, and again, that gets into the business side of things. It gets into the business and the marketing side which is it's just adds absolutely vital if you're going to be successful. You know, you guys know that because you've worked that for a really long time. So. If you're going to bother to drive across the state, and gee, if I could bring that with you, then you could come home with it, and yeah. it's a done thing, and I'll take a deposit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pre-sales. It's a good idea. All right, so art shows. Um, I think we've gone over the, the cons, uh, bad weather. Everybody knows that that can kill a show, um, and they don't get canceled. You just, um, yeah, it's not fun. You just lose. So obviously, 
you know, you're controlling a little bit more about what you're selling. You're controlling your destiny. And I, like I said, I do have friends who do it, and they do it successfully, and they've done it successfully for years, and I don't think they'd ever consider doing it another way. And that really works for them. So, and if that really works for somebody, then that's what they should do. Um, all right. And do you have all of your own stuff? Do you, so you do it regularly? So you have all of your own equipment? Well, I'm not doing the big shows anymore. I was only making, I, I was making the booth fee back and I was making maybe a few hundred dollars more and it was way too much work. And when my knees went last spring, I wasn't sure just how many more times I could put that thing up and I, I'm trying to find other ways. Yeah. I'm still doing some little outdoor shows, but not the big ones. Yeah, it's rough. It's really rough. I've, I've helped a number of people set up booths. So, and I've looked at it and thought, maybe I should do this, and I go, no. The air is so clean really. at 4 in the morning. Huh? The air is so crisp and clean at 4 o'clock in the morning. Yes, and it's dark, and you're sitting there turning enough light to, yeah. <clears throat> All right, co-ops, which is what you had asked about. And um, there's a number of different co-ops, so it's very difficult to nail it down because there's so many different varieties of ways. Your pros is that you control, for the most part, normally in a co-op, you control the price of your work. Your percentages that you're paying are lower because you do pay a percentage to the co-op. Usually, roughly, co-op percentages are somewhere between 15 and 30 percent. 15 is very low, and that's that's usually there's 15 because you're also helping to pay for other things. So there's there's different things to consider on that. Um, you may control your hours there. I put a little asterisk next to that because you may not control your hours there. In some co-ops, um, there's a very small co-op over in Dunedin um, where the, the metal workers are right on, um, yeah, right on Douglas. So, and in there, they control their own hours because what they have is little offices, basically. So it's a little bit different. Some co-ops are wide open space like this and it's all sharing space and you have like a little cubicle set up. Um, some of them are like the one in Dunedin where you have a little office space with a door. So you can come and go as you please. So it, it, that kind of depends. Um, and in some co-ops, the cooperative is, hey, here's a big space and let's all share the rent. And you share the rent and you share the utilities and it's divided equally between everybody and then what you do is what you do. You come and go as you please, you have your artwork up. Some of them, like I said, it's a big space. Somebody goes, oh, I'm going to rent a big space, and I'm going to rent out little sections of it to people, and it's a cooperative space. Um, then you don't have control over when your art is being viewed or not viewed, or you know, and people may be coming in and going up and handling your art or touching it when you're not around. Um, so you really have to look at it, because co-ops are just very broad. It's kind of hard to, to say that there's one description for a cooperative. Um, you do want to make sure, obviously, that if you have an open space, the cons are, um, you know, is your work safe? Is it going to be stolen, damaged, or anything else? And is the cooperative carrying insurance to cover your work? To make sure that if it is damaged, that you're not out a piece of work. So, um, the hours that you have to be there might not be convenient for you. So that's something to consider, too. If it's an open space, and it's open from, you know, one time to another, that might not work for you. Um, if you are you know, if you're working 100% on your art, maybe that works for you to go ahead and set up your studio space there as well. And some cooperatives are studio and sales space. So it's public space and also workspace at the same time. So maybe that works for you. But if you're working another job in addition to working on your art, their hours may not work. Um, who's overseeing the operations and how are they running the business? Because if you're in a cooperative where you have a stall or anything like that, you know, are they doing your marketing? Are they not marketing? Are they, you know, putting ads out in the newspaper? Is that included in part of your cooperative fees that you're paying? You know, those are all things that you have to look at. And each cooperative sets things up very differently. So, um, you know, so you have to take a look at that as well. Um, I have to say that most co-ops, other than just saying that they exist, they're not really doing anything for individual artists. They're just telling people about the cooperative itself. Um, the other thing is, you know, who's handling the marketing and PR? Again, most of the time that's still the artist's responsibility in the cooperative. It's the space that you're sharing. You're not really getting anything from that like you would out of a gallery space. There's one in Dunedin. It's called Seven Arches Gallery, mm -hmm. and it's on Keene and Main. And the fees that the artists pay 
uh, go into sharing a marketing person and they have probably two to three a minimum of two to three events a month I'm really impressed by them yeah uh, they um, they can reduce their rent by working as well or not reduce their rent by choosing not to work and it's very um, delineated whose wall it belongs to whose art but they do they have uh, multiple shows every single month the last Friday of every single month they do their e-blast that's one that um, is active yeah there's, nice and there's a, like St Sterling Gallery yeah, is very there's a active. couple in Ebor City there's one or two in Clearwater there they are around um, but this is why you want to just know the right questions to ask when you go in there so and it is good because yeah you're right I mean there are a few of them doing that which is yeah. smart you know um, and you want to talk to the artists and find out are they successfully selling their work? Because I know one place, unfortunately, has somebody who's supposed to be doing their social media marketing for them. Not very good. You know somebody else who hired like a college, you know, kid to do the social media, and that person's doing, you know, gangbusters, and it's working out really well. So, so you want to talk to the other artists. If you want to go into a cooperative, definitely talk to the other artists that have been in there for a little bit and see how their experience has been. Um, so. Um, also, you know, what are you getting in exchange for the rent? So you need to know, like, what percentage you're paying. How do the co-ops work? Are you paying a portion of the rent, or are you paying, you know, percentage of your art, or is it a combination? Again, it's, it's looking over the contracts. So, and some people actually want to be able to teach, oh, yeah, what if you don't get along with the other artists? <laughs> now, if you're in a contract and it's a binding contract and you don't get along with the other artists, well, you're kind of out of luck because you're in a binding contract and you're going to have to find a way to get out of that contract or you're just going to have to put up with the other artists whether it's an issue or not. So there's no way to get back out of that if you're under contract. And then is there room to teach the classes should you want to because some people actually want to be able to instruct people and teach people. Um, so you have to look at that. Um, when you're choosing where you want to put your work you have to really look at it being the right fit for you because you have to make sure that it's giving back to you you know, and you're able to give to it, and, and it's a it's a good cooperative relationship. So, um, so when you're checking out a place like that, you want to if, if you think a co-op is really going to work for you, and usually you make more money at a co-op than you make at a gallery for the most part. Um, hours are generally more flexible, so there are some some definite pros to a co-op as opposed to going to a gallery. But again, you want to select a good co-op, like you know what we were talking about, the place over here in Dunedin some place where they're taking the time to do the marketing and let people know about you and you know have shows and find out how successful those shows are. If you're interested in the co-op, find out when their next show is and show up and see how many people are actually there for the show. Do they have like one or two stragglers walking through? Do they have a group of people going in there? Is it really busy? Is there a lot of activity? You know, do you see a lot of sales happening? You know, take the time to see if this is really the right kind of venue for you and ask questions. And honestly, I think that any time when you're in a situation and you're asking questions, if the person you're asking questions to suddenly gets defensive and and aggravated with you for asking questions, walk away because they're hiding something. If they're if they if they're offended and all get haughty on you, it's oh, what what are they hiding? You know, what are they not telling you that they get defensive that way? Um, if they're a good ethical business person, they're not going to have any problem answering your questions. They're going to understand that you have concerns. So when we create our art, we create something that's very personal for us. So, you know, it's okay to be a little protective over that. One of the things I wanted to mention is my observation of co-ops is that they all come within different price ranges. Mm -hmm. And depending on how you want to price your art, you'll be able to find... So if, let's say that you're average price is $1,200 and you go into a place that has a bunch of $326 pieces. Well, they might be great artists, but when somebody's looking at your piece and falling in love with it and looking at somebody else's piece, that might incorrectly color their decisions. So it, it tend, people tend to uh, group uh, lower, medium, and higher end price points. So it's, it's just an interesting thing. Same thing with your artwork too. You know, go in the co-op and see what other art is hanging in there, and does your art work well with that other art, or are they conflicting? You know, do you have something that when you put it next to somebody else's art, it just you just go, whoa, you know, that can happen too. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. 
So a little bit of investigating on those, but I think cooperatives can work really well. Um, you also have lease studio space. You know, pros, it's your space. You own it. You can come and go as you please, um, depending on your agreement with your landlord. In some cases, you can do pretty much what you want with the space. Um, you know, you can open it, close it. That is one thing, though, that you have to check out. Is this a situation where you can't have public come into your studio, but you want to be able to have public come into your studio? So if you're going to lease a private space, you really want to make sure that it's something that works for you, that you can get everything out of it. But you have to take a look at how are you going to cover the rent and the utilities and everything else. It is more expensive than sharing spaces with people, generally speaking. Um, although, like I said, the, the one, and I have a couple of artists who moved in up, who are moving upstairs from the art center now, because he rents out these rooms that are 15 by 15 to 12 by 12, somewhere in that range, for $175 a month. And there's water in the wall and he doesn't care. You can put in a sink and anything else. It's just old pine heartwood pine floors. So his only stipulation is don't ruin the floors, but you can paint the walls any way you want. You can do whatever you want to the space and everything else. Just, you know, take care of the hardwood floors. So you got to throw down, you know, oil cloth and stuff. So, um, so there are places where you can find more affordable spaces. And then you have to look at realistically, are you going to make the drive there to use it? You know, is it just going to sit? I've had that happen before. I've rented space and it was at such a distance that I didn't feel like driving there all the time, it just sat. So, um, you're your own boss, but that can also be a con because it depends on how self motivated you are. You know, if you're just there by yourself, are you going to go and are you actually going to get the work done? And then when you get the work done, are you going to take the steps necessary to make sure it actually gets out and gets sold? And if your space can be open to the public, are you going to take the time to then market yourself? Are you going to take the time to go out and do your social media and you know put an ad in the paper or do whatever is needed to bring people in? So, and how do you pay the bills if something doesn't sell? So, then you have public spaces, and this is something that some people are doing. Um, <coughs> I have an artist who's actually going to be coming into the center. He does very interesting pop art. His pieces have been hanging in some restaurants and some different interesting places in St. Pete. Um, in his case, he's actually paying wherever they're, they're hanging 50% commission, which I find really kind of bothers, you know, it's like, why would you do that? Because it's just hanging in a public space with nobody to talk to about the art. If somebody has questions about the art or the artist, these guys really don't know anything about him. Um, there's no contact information there, you know. If somebody's, in, and matter of fact, he said that a couple of his pieces, he was told by one place that people showed interest, but they liked the pieces up there so much that they didn't try to sell them because they want to keep the art on the wall. <laughs> and in some of these cases, you're actually contracted to leave your art up for a 12-month period of time or whatever. The place is getting free decor, and you can't sell it. So you need to be very careful when you're going into a public space. If your work is damaged, is it covered by insurance? You know, are they going to make sure that it's covered? Or are they going to fight you on it? Um, you know, are you being contracted? If you're not under contract, you know, what kind of percentage are you going to pay these guys for letting your art hang up there? Are they going to actually allow you to put your contact information up so people can contact you? Um, is anybody even going to bother to try to sell it? People go, great, it's free exposure, but it doesn't do any good if somebody sees a piece of art and they go, oh, I yeah. love that piece of art. I wonder who the artist is. That was a great piece of art. And they walk away because they have nobody to talk to about it, nobody to sell it to them, and they have no way to tell who did the piece, so they're not going to find you. I'm not going to try to read your signature and Google you, although they might. I did that once. But, you know, most people aren't necessarily going to do that. So hanging in public spaces, unfortunately, has a lot more cons, I think, than it does pros. Unless you're doing something like, you know, you're working through something like Jerry has, has worked so that these pieces are going up in specific places and there are, you know, careful contracts worked out. And I'm sure they are in spaces where insurance is in place and pieces are protected and pieces are actually selling, which is good. So um, Sometimes when we put pieces in public spaces, the only way that we'll do it is if we can do massive public relations. So then that way if somebody does see it or if then they Google, you know, art piece on blah, blah wall, a name can come up and a contact name can be found. Because there's got to be some exchange if you're not going to get paid for it and right. if you keep it up there for X period of time. You have to have bragging rights. You have to be able to put it on your website. You just have to. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I have seen that on some artist resumes. You know, they've sent it to the center and stuff. They've had pieces up in public places. And you know that they've put them up there just to be able to say that they put them up there, but that's fine. As long as you're able to put that on your resume and as long as that particular space looks good on your resume. That's the same thing with galleries. If you can get into a really good gallery that has a great reputation, etc., at least 
things. It used to be worthwhile having that that gallery's name on your resume. You know, well, my work was you know featured at such and such a gallery. Well, I was so. actually just about ready to say that if a goal is to get into a certain gallery, let's say you've got one that you you really admire and you say, okay, well, within the next two to three years, I want to get in there. Take a look at the resume of the people hanging there, because. Doing the donations, working the shows, winning the ribbons, applying to, to win awards, being in public spaces, they're all stepping stones. Once upon a time we used to call it a listed artist, right? And it was a title to be a listed artist and, and there was a, res a recipe in order to do that. And while at least around this area people don't talk about that anymore, it's still very important. So. Um, everything that you do takes you to another place. So maybe you can't get into your ideal location in 2015, but if you set your sights and say in 2018, I'm going to be able to be in, you know, and thank goodness for LinkedIn. And it's okay to shamelessly promote yourself or find somebody <coughs> to, to write something nice for you. But if, if what you got out of putting yourself in a public space was that you could say that you hung in the wherever. Um, you know, we had a great opportunity one time. Scott was hanging in the VIP lounge of the Mahaffey, and they were going to buy, and we were so excited. In fact, we never tell anybody that you did that, because we were so angry that they decided not to buy from him, because they knew they could get another artist to hang for free. Mm. And, and, and our, you know, our ego was hurt, and we were angry, because we thought we had a sale. She was on her way over with the money, and she showed up with the mm. art pieces didn't want the art pieces back, <laughs> wanted the money. Um, but if we did bother to tell somebody, you know, that would be a nice stepping stone to something else. So everything has value. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right, which brings us to online art sites. Does anybody have any questions about anything so far? Because I don't mind if hands go up or if you have any comments of your own, any of the experiences of your own you want to share on. Um, online art sites. Um, <clears throat> so far in the research that I've done on online art sites, and there are some new ones popping up, and I've been checking those out as well. Um, Art.com has a sister site, which is for, un, you know, for for artists that are not Renoir and you know, etc. For all the prints that they sell, um, and so I've been checking out, you know, the, the pros and cons with these guys. Um, what's what's the, the name of Art.com sister site? I had to ask, didn't I? You had to ask, didn't you? Yeah. I'll have to look it up before we read tonight. Art. I do not remember. Art.net. <laughs> well, I'd like, I'd like to hear you delineate the different... I mean, there's there's a, so many subcategories of online art sets. So there's the there there's the online retail things. Right. The art.com, the Wayfarers, the Amazons. And then there's the... Um, what's that one that so many people... Etsy. Fine Art America. Fine Art America. Fine Art America. Etsy's great for the originals. Crafty. What's that? Yeah. It's sort of more crafty. That's more crafty. Yeah, Fine Art America is incredibly and the, public. And the average ticket price on an, on an item that sells at Etsy is $90. So, which is why your craftier people are on there, or people selling really little pieces. Or I have one artist who's going to be at the art center and she sells cards with her art on it, with her art printed on it. So, yeah, so Etsy is a smaller dollar amount on art sales for sure. But I do have some artists who get, you know, Started. decent money that way because they're selling a whole ton of these little pieces for, you know, and they're selling a lot of them. So they're, they're getting a lot of them printed and selling a lot of them. And, you know, that adds up. So that is a possibility if you want to be bothered with, you know, the $95 pieces to just keep selling a whole bunch of stuff. So, um... It does break down, and I didn't break it down a tremendous amount, but we can talk about it because I've looked at all sorts of things. Amazon, you have yeah. to have barcodes. You have to have yeah, ISBNs. Yeah, I, I just worry about the scammy stuff. You have to have ISBNs for, for uh, Amazon. It's a little bit difficult to sell your work there unless you, at least originals, unless you have a, a ton of ton of the, the same thing. You're just printing and selling the same thing, and you can put an ISBN barcode on it. Um, Art.com's sister site, um, the, the more major, there's there's uh, a few of them. I should have gotten their names, and I have them like, on another document. I'll go home. check real quick. I have them on another document at home that's very okay, frustrating. I'm curious. How much are artists doing this now? I know, I know if you want to do a book, they can charge 
costs anywhere from two hundred to five hundred dollars for you a do one a book, shot. If you do a book through Amazon, you don't pay anything through Create. Well, I'm not saying for your that, ISBN. but you have to get an ISBN. If they say you supply your own ISBN, you have to pay for that. Right, but if you get an ISB, if you're doing a book and you do it through Create Space on Amazon, then that ISBN comes with the book. Okay, you but what if you're doing this thing, this this piece of artwork right there? It can be anywhere <coughs> from seventy-five dollars on up, okay. depending. It depends because you can get package deals. You buy so many ISBNs, and you know they'll give you this many for this much. So it can go. So, many out there. Yeah. so it can go kind of expensive. But if it's something that you think again, you're going to sell it repeatedly over and over and over again, and you're going to make enough money. Um, I have a friend of mine who's actually doing sublimation printing. She's printing her artwork on mats and selling them, and she thinks that she may do enough of this that down the road she'll go ahead and spend the money to put the, the barcodes on her work and and sell it. So, for right now, she's held off on. So, uh, and this is part of the reason why I've researched so many of these different things. Um, I do not really care for the art.com type sites. They pay you a very, very, very low percentage for your work. It's true that they handle everything, but some of them pay as low as 8%, and they do nothing to promote you. Now, you can pay more money if you want to be featured, and there's different things that you can do to try to get featured on there and become a featured artist and be a little bit more prevalent, but otherwise, you have to go on and get searched for. So, do you guys have experience with any of these? Have you done any of them? And what's your experience done with them? Um, Scott is on art.com, Scott is on all posters. In the beginning, when people hadn't seen his style, we put 35 images out there just so that people would get used to it because we were just running into what is that um, and we went through a licensing person who I don't love and I don't um, respect but he still has the license and when I go and beat him up I get some money and for every paper print he, we sell we get seven dollars and for every canvas print we get twelve dollars no and matter it, what size no matter what size. Yeah. So he can be in, like, he's got hotels in New York City where he's in every single bathroom. And it's huge. And it's $7 and $12. And the reporting is, but for that, he is on art.com. He is on posters.com. And people do find us there. And then they do come and find us at ours. But not so much. Sometimes. Yeah. Um, Did you want to say something about that? Yeah. Well, I had a friend who, who came in and told me that he saw one of my pieces in the hotel in Key West. And it was through this uh, publishing company. And then I called the publishing company and then he, uh, he helped out the check, money. Finally. Got to seven dollars. So it, yeah. it's, it's very easy <laughs> to, to get ripped off, <coughs> unfortunately, in these situations. Because, yeah, they can sell your art. You have no idea they sold it. You don't know. You don't know. You know, they just be taking everything, and they do take a hefty, hefty chunk. So, and they sign your name. Yes. Yeah. They do sign your name. They do. So, um, so I really encourage people to kind of stay away from that end of things. There are different art sites where you are in control of selling your art. Like you said, there's Etsy. There's um, the other one that we just mentioned a minute ago. Fine art. Fine art. Um, so yeah. you know, and, and some of those sites artists have been pretty happy with. You still have to be able to do the marketing. On that, and and that's the that's the great challenge with the online world, is that regardless of what you're doing, you really have to still do your marketing. It all comes back down to that. Um, and you can, you know, we'll get into the other option of your own website too in just a minute too. Um, so when you do online, you know, uh, they may market you if you play the game right. Like I said. Um, you don't have to handle printing and shipping to handle all of that for you, but then they give you such a tiny amount that I guess if you're selling massive quantities, thousands upon thousands. And, you know. Well, there are a bunch of sites like Wayfair and um, that genre where they s you're listed, they sell, and you handle the printing. You handle the fulfillment of it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so basically, that's a it's an online s retail store. And they get the retail. They get the wholesale. Client buys retail. They get wholesale. They pay net thirty. They pull out four percent for um, problems. So we had some. 
we've been with them about eight years. We've had one return. And the good news was we were paying that 4%, and so we didn't have to give our money back. And we got our back. Um, yay. Have you said that? Wayfair. Wayfair? Yeah, they're advertising on TV a lot now. They're, they're, they've gotten pretty big. So. Yeah. yeah. But um, they are moving to the world of Amazon where they want you to have a barcode. Um, they're, they're, it's very, they, pr they provide a spreadsheet, and you must do the spreadsheet the way they want the spreadsheet. But if you think about it from their viewpoint, they're dealing with millions and millions and millions of uh, pieces of merchandise, so you kind of have to. That's the all about bar stools, all about table lamps, all about lights that hang three inches from the ceiling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they are the niche marketer, and they take every single little minute. Yeah. So, you know, you do have some better retailers to deal with there. Um, but again, you still have to do <coughs> marketing because there's, they have so many people going to their site your work may or may not be found, so you still have to drive people there. Um, so then you've got uh, the other option of your own website, social media. I know a fair amount of artists who've gotten familiar enough, who are comfortable enough with computers and have gotten familiar enough with different software programs, that they're just building their own WordPress sites and they're managing them themselves. So, because if you have to pay somebody to build a website for you, then you don't understand how to manage it, and you have to manage it yourself. It becomes expensive. Something that I've done for some artist friends of mine over the last few years is I've built the WordPress sites for because I do custom WordPress sites for people. WordPress needs so I've built their site from the way they want it and then taught them how to go in and do the editing themselves so that they can just handle it all themselves after that, and they don't have to continue to pay somebody to do upkeep. Um, there are some advantages to that because you, um, well, I put down, you're the person handling your PR and marketing, which can be an advantage if you handle it and a disadvantage if you don't do anything. Because you can put up the most beautiful website in the world and if nobody ever finds it, you're never going to sell a thing. Um, so there are some challenges to, to having uh, a website up there. Um, you do control the price of your own artwork. You set your own hours, so if you want to work at 2 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the evening, you know, any time, you're a bit of your own master over that. However, um, um, besides credit card fees, you know, you're keeping all the money, because in most cases you want to do something like set up PayPal. And these days, it doesn't have to be complicated, because you can go in with a PayPal account, and you can set up <coughs> a PayPal button for each piece of work that you're selling and put that PayPal button right on your website. It's very, actually very easy to do it and taught people how to do this, so they very easily add another piece and add a button for it on their website. Um, and that's it. You don't. It used to be that you had to have special software for a shopping cart and this and that and everything else, but you know, it's become a whole lot easier for people to actually set up their own stores online. I even <coughs> had, we were doing, with the Art Center, we were doing uh, fundraising for the Art Center to be able to do all of our renovations and everything. And I have other artists who, have gone out and done crowdfunding. And they're like, you should do crowdfunding through blah, blah, blah. And I said, I'm not going to give them 9% when they do nothing to drive people in to raise money for you. Because they don't promote you. You know, unless they, you just happen to be their selection of the week and then maybe you're promoted. But, you know, again, you're a drop in the bucket. So, so you go and put this thing up and then you have to drive everybody to it for the donations and they're going to keep, you know, 9% or whatever of, of it. Or I could turn around and throw up a one-page site really quick with a bunch of donation buttons that looks just like their page, and I could drive people to that instead, and I only pay 29% of PayPal. So that's what I did. Because when we tried doing the, the crowdfunding site, it failed. And if you don't hit your goal, you don't get any of the money. And over here, I get it as it comes in, so that we were able to keep the renovations rolling all the time. So, But things have gotten a lot easier on the web side of things. Um, so the pro and con is that you're the person handling your PR and marketing. If you know how to do your marketing, that's great. <coughs> if you don't, the question is, is how do you find out? Um, you have to handle all the sales and fulfillment. So you know you have to handle it when the sale comes in, get it packaged and get it shipped and everything else. Um, I, I think I might know somebody who could probably you know give good advice on that and help on that. Um, you have to be able to maintain your website or pay somebody to do it. So, 
Um, you have to have an excellent working knowledge of social media marketing. Really, if you have a website and you want to drive people to it, and this is how you really want to make sales, you have to know how to use social media marketing and which ones are actually worth putting your time into. And then how do you do it? Is it worth having a Twitter account? Is it worth having uh, you know, a LinkedIn account? Do I go on Pinterest? How do you even build it up? So there's, there's a lot of that. And really, if you want to be successful, you have to do that. And how do you get yourself up to Google rankings? Because somebody goes and Googles um, contemporary artist Florida. How many things are going to come up in front of you? I can guarantee you the museums are and the big galleries are going to come up long before you. So you're going to be 15 pages in and nobody's going to search that far. So, you know, it, it makes it a bit of a challenge. So um, knowing how to play that game is a little bit interesting. And it takes a lot of time to build up followings of buyers. Now, I've had this scenario. Artist goes, oh, yeah, you know, I promote myself on Facebook all the time. And I have... I have 900 followers, and they all like my page, and I go, are they all your friends? Are they buyers? Oh, there are other artists. Are they buying your work? No. I belong to this art group on Facebook that's now grown to 20, almost 29,000 members. And people are in there promoting their art. Okay, you're promoting your art to 29,000 people, but they're all other artists. How many of these other artists are gonna buy your work? It's great for a collaborative thing if you want to talk to somebody, if you want some opinions, if you want some ideas, if you want, you know, if you want a little bit of news, you know, you can go in there and get some inspiration, but these people aren't buying your work. So if it's all your friends who like your page, that's not really helping you. So you have to know how to use those to build those things up because, and that takes time. And you have, and, and there's a little bit of a trick to it and learning how to get people to like and come to your page who are actually buyers is who wants to spend the time doing this and not sell anything. Because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get our art out there. So, and you can spend hours and hours on ineffective promotion with no sales. And I've seen it. And then people go, you know, it doesn't work to sell your art on the internet at all. It just doesn't work. And I go, really? Why is that? Well, I've been promoting and I have my 900 friends on Facebook and I have my... And I go, well, you're not really going to sell your art that way. So, and it's not the internet, but it's, it's a lot of work. So when you look at having a website to sell your artwork, you have to take a look at how much are you willing to learn about the internet and about social media marketing and really promoting yourself. You can actually do it. I have a friend of mine, Thula, who does very well on online sales. She sells her art through... Um, Shoot. She sells her art through one of the art websites, and I can't think of it, but it's one where you control it, and you're controlling your work, and you're doing your fulfillment and everything else. And she does very well with it. Um, she spends a lot of time marketing, and she knows how to do it. She's learned from people who do social media marketing, and she knows how to do it. And she's much more willing to do that than she is to go out, because she lives with another friend of mine, and has her studio with another friend of mine who goes out and does the shows. And that person goes out and does the shows, and she does really great at the shows, and that's what she loves to do. And you couldn't convince her to do anything on the internet if you tried. And she's, she does sculpture, too. And she said, I can't ship this stuff easily, you know. I don't want to do website sales. And then, you know, here's my other friend who's doing terrific with her website sales. So, again, it comes down to which one is the best fit for you? What do you see yourself more willing to do in all these different scenarios? So... Um, you know, how is somebody going to find you out there on the, the internet? Because it's a really big space. You have the entire <coughs> world out there. So um, so I wrote here, what many artists do not consider is that there's a business side to being an artist. You're an entrepreneur if you're an artist. You are. You're your own boss. You're your own business. Un you know, unfortunately, like I said, we can't just go lock ourselves in the studio and create, not unless you're fortunate enough to have an entire team out there working for you for whatever, to promote you and handle everything for you. Or if you've gotten good enough, and even the artists I know that have gotten good enough who have personal assistants, do you still do some of your own work, Scott, or do you just sit and do nothing but artwork all the time? <laughs> yeah, the artwork's actually a small percentage. It's almost like I have a full time job. <coughs> You know, it wasn't the way I envisioned it when I start, but that's the way it works out, you know. Yeah. I'm on the phone making phone calls, you know, to anyone I can think of, and, you know, signing up for art festivals, and 
There's just millions of things to do. You know, I'm doing email marketing and working on my website and creating that and preparing spreadsheets, you know, for these other websites like House and um, yeah. the other one. Building boxes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah nice. I have to yeah, ship my own artwork. I have some staff <coughs> now, but uh, I don't know how to build boxes and I have to ship my own artwork. Yeah. And you're still doing, you know, all of this stuff, which is true even when you do have a staff, which is why and I said, you know, every successful artist I know spends more time on their business than they do on the creation of their art. Every single one. So, Scott included. We could name off a whole bunch of people that we know. Um, who are successful with their art, but every single one of them spends more time, far more time on the business side of things. And that's the reality of it. And it, it might not be one that we like very much, but um, that is true because I've talked to a number of artists and helped out a number of artists and helped train a number of artists and teach them the ropes and everything else. And like I wrote down here, I don't win popularity contests by the things that I say. If you're not making money as an artist, are you running your art like a business? Are you marketing it properly? Are you also honing your skills as an artist? Are you doing anything to improve yourself in your craft? So, because we have to look at the big picture, right? Um, we may love the pieces that we create, and those close to us may love them and everything else. But if the public doesn't love them, then they're not going to buy them. And sometimes that's a hard pill to swallow. I know I have created things that I thought were just awesome, and people thought were awesome. Only the people who thought they were awesome were my mom, my sister, <laughs> my husband, and I just wanted to spend the kind of money that I would need to make out of what I just put into it. And that's a hard pill to swallow sometimes, too. So, you know, like I said down here, what are you doing to better yourself and your craft? What are you doing to improve your technique and get better than you are? So there's a whole thing to it. It's an evolutionary process. I think, Scott, you can probably say it's an evolutionary process as an artist, too, because you also have to watch the market. And maybe you're creating, you know, I have one friend who created very, you know, a very pop art piece. Well, that gets dated after a while. Even a piece, there's a piece that I did 26 years ago. And it sold, and it went to a home, and it sat in that home for years and years and years and years and years and years. And years and then the person died, and then it ended up working its way back to me, and I got my piece back, and I look at it, and I hate it, because it looks like I made it in, in the late 1980s, because it looks very late 1980s, and I'm never going to resell it, because I don't think anybody wants to buy it these days. <laughs> You're gonna, yes? In my early pieces, I created the, the color palette you know, out of my imagination. I was doing art festivals. People love those color combinations, but they didn't go well in their homes. So then I started being more aware of color palettes and looking through catalogs and finding color palettes are more uh, of what people were decorating with, you know, this this year. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. That piece that I got back ended up hanging in Mosey in a, in a special show that they had for four months. But it's it's retired now. So I'm not going to hang it out for sale any place. But, you know, it, it, it's interesting. Like you said, like you were just saying, though, Scott, I mean, you'll find these things out as you're out you know, working with your pieces and such, so. I, I want to um, augment something to what Scott said because he gets a lot of crap for saying stuff like that. And so the lesson of that is who are you and who do you want to be? We have kids, we have a big building, he has to sell, he has to make money, otherwise, you know, the alternative is we go off and get jobs and this is an awful lot of work and we don't mind doing it. So his work, some people might say, goes more decor. He's okay with that. He's actually coming out with a line of originals that would be more of the fine art. If you are fine with the decor, if you're the person who says, it's okay, art can match your throw pillows, awesome. <laughs> if you're the person that says, I don't care what color the throw pillows are, I'm going to create what I want to create, awesome. And while you're evaluating where you're going to put your work, how you're going to price it, you, you need to be very aware of that and what your limits are because that will help guide you and it will help you get from here to there faster. It doesn't have to be the full-time endeavor 
And I'm really sorry that Shelly's been a real drag, <laughs> a real downer. I am. <laughs> I am. Well, I think no. at the art, at the art <coughs> festival is 90%, maybe even 95% of people are looking for something that looks, looks good over their couch. Right. And it's decor. Whereas yeah. the 5%, maybe 10% at most are uh -huh. reflectors where it doesn't matter. They just fell in love with a piece and they want to buy it. Right. I'm one of those people who I do buy other artists' work. I don't want to see my artwork in my house. Other people can have that. I want other people's artwork in my house. And I have an eclectic mix of art in my house. So I'm one of those people who does wander the festivals. And and go to every place I possibly can. And if I see a piece of art and I like that piece of art, that piece of art is going to come home with me. So, you know, I, I don't care about above the sofa or anything else. I have one artist from Miami, and I have these little prints from him, and actually they're little originals from him, the little, little guys, little tiny things. And I have four of them, and they're really cool. They're like pop art, art deco, funky little things. There's a little black cat in each, every one of them. And it's got all the bright Art Deco colors, and I just absolutely love the pieces. And so did my husband, and they came home with us, and they're up on the wall. And then I have three other pieces by a, by an artist who does like jazz musicians and very vibrant colors that are you know that are just amazing. <coughs> and I have a mask from Africa hanging on my wall, so you know, I mean, go figure. So I don't I don't really I don't match any of my artwork, but a lot of people do. So I'm a very small percentage, where a lot of people are looking for things that are more mass appeal. Um, so, yeah, that is something to take into consideration. So, um, so where, this is how, through all of this and every, all my research that I've done and everything else, um, coming back to why I opened up Clearwater, or why I'm opening up Clearwater Center for the Arts, we're opening March 21st, is, um, you know, I looked at all the options out there, and I wanted to come what bothers me is that I didn't see any option out there that gave an artist the tools to be successful. <coughs> and while it's great that a gallery can market your art, it's not what is it doing for you? What is it teaching you? What is it doing to help you expand so that you can make more money through your art and be successful as an artist? And I really wanted to try to put something together that embraced a whole lot of things that I like about art. First of all, for years and years and years, however many hundreds, probably thousands of years, if you wanted to be an artist, you started at a very young age, and you apprenticed with a master. And you sat with that master, and you handed him brushes, and you cleaned his brushes for him, and you mixed his paints and did everything else. And you learned how that master did what they did. And then from that, you learned your craft. And then you yourself became a master and then some of you would work with you, and then you had various apprentices. And that's how artists learned. We didn't learn by going to school and studying theory, and I know some people are schooled and some people are self-taught, and I think that it's, it's, it's great you know, to go to college and, and learn all the theories and everything, and if you really enjoy that, that's tremendous. But I think personally for myself, a lot of it was just too extraneous. It didn't have anything to do with about teaching me a craft as an artist. And, and how, how to do things. One of the things that I liked about my, my art class, and somebody found this very bizarre when I was explaining it to them, was that um, in my sophomore year of high school, my art teacher ta taught us how to take chalk dust and egg yolk and water and make our own paints. <coughs> and so he was teaching us all these different ways to make all these different paints and how to work with all these different mediums. <coughs> that, I think, is, is such, a, such a skill. So I wanted some place where people could come regardless of their backgrounds or anything else, and they could even be professional artists, and learn from another artist who's mastered a specific technique, and learn how to do that specific technique by working with them. I also wanted to be able to have programs, community outreach for outreach children and for disadvantaged kids who were themselves aspiring artists to actually come and be an apprentice for an artist. Um, so I, I put together a little bit of a unique program and that was, you know, we had artists submit, we have a selection committee who helps select them. I didn't want the personal pressure of selecting artists for the art center. Um, and what we did was we encouraged these, we have two different ways that an artist can be at the art center. One, they can just be a straight gallery artist. Arts on the wall, we do all the marketing and everything else, they don't lift a finger, they pay 50% to the gallery, they keep 50%. 
that isn't exactly what I wanted, but I had it out there <coughs> just in case that's really what an artist wanted. I have three artists, and that's what they're doing. And they're fine with that because it's a lower price than they're paying, and they're happy with where it's going, and they're happy with that. And that's a great arrangement. All the rest of the other artists are going to be what we call participating artists. They're donating <laughs> 12 hours a month of their time to the art center. They're getting 75%. The gallery keeps 25%. They can also teach classes and keep 75%. Art center keeps 25%, but we promote the classes. We fill the classes. We do everything. All they have to do is teach the classes. And actually, any artist can come and teach classes at the art center. Uh, they can submit to teach classes at the art center. They don't have to have their art on display to actually teach classes there. Um, but those guys who are participating artists, when instead of having them help me around the art center, I'm finding other people who can help me around the art center, and I'm taking those people who donate their 12 hours a month, and we're using that for them to be able to mentor, apprentice, you know, and do things that are bringing the arts back out to the community, and um, and doing philanthropic work. So it's a little bit unique, and not having them help me with the administration or anything else. But the other thing that we're doing for our artists is the participating artists who are at the Art Center will, for free, get seminars and training on how to do their marketing, on how to build their website if they want to do it, on everything that they need to know to get every single tool for running a business, from the administrative side to keeping their books to handling their inventory to everything. They'll get all of their tools on running a business. So any artist that's working with us is a participating artist. For the 25% that they're paying the art center in commission, they're not just getting their work marketed and sold. They're getting every single tool that they need in order to run a business as an artist and be successful. So we're doing everything we can to help these artists out. Um, and then we're also offering those as open seminars to, to artists, and I want to do them at a very, 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 very reduced price so that people can actually afford to come to them and learn them. Because I think it's so important for artists to learn the business side of things. And for me, I just happened to luck out. 20 years ago, I had somebody hire me into a marketing company to do graphics, and they ended up teaching me the ropes of marketing. And I worked that. So, you know, I got to learn that side of things. But not everybody has that. So I want to take that knowledge and the knowledge of other people who agreed to come to the Art Center and, you know, make sure that our artists and other artists out there are learning how to actually run themselves successfully as an artist. So, where, where is your art center? We're opening up on 621 <coughs> Cleveland Street, which is right in downtown Clearwater. I thought it was still, okay. Yeah, 621 so, Cleveland? 620, 621 oh, Cleveland Street. It's right near the corner of Garden in Cleveland. And when will it open? Right in downtown. Oh, you got it right It's going to open on March 21st. We <coughs> were supposed to open on March 7th, but it conflicted with a major city event, which means nobody would be able to get to us or find parking. <laughs> so we had to move it to the 21st. So, but that's I'm sorry, I need to read. I'll put you on my list. And even if, even if somebody, you know, if you want to be able to submit, you want to get on the waiting list to come in. But also, anybody who's on my email list, we are going to be having special shows like in April, and this is tentative right now. Um, we're going to be doing something with the Veterans um, Alliance in Pinellas County. Um, and we're going to have a veterans event, and that'll be a show that goes on for a week. So we're going to have art in there by veterans. Um, the following month after that, in May, on May 20th, so we're already scheduling our events out. On May 20th, um, that is the day for the Emancipation Proclamation in Florida. That's when Florida finally adopted it. Um, was like May 18 something like two years after the United States <laughs> actually issued it, Florida adopted it. And so we're going to be celebrating that on May 20th, and we're going to be doing that with artwork that has to do with um, issues of slavery, human rights, human trafficking, you know, anything that would center around the Emancipation Proclamation. So when we have those events, I'll be sending out open calls to artists who are on the mailing list to say, we have this event going on. If you have artwork that you want to submit for the show, and, you know, that way, even if you're not on the walls all the time, you have the opportunity. And those shows are going to be happening monthly, and they, they last for a week. And there will be a lot of PR, a lot, a lot of PR being done about those events. So, so we can get as much coverage as possible. So. What other questions do we have? I haven't looked at the time. Um, one thing I was wondering about is there's a small hotel on St. Pete Beach I've been staying at for years. And he's got this tacky IKEA artwork on the walls 
Um, and one of the things that I had thought about is, you know, offering artwork, change it out, whatever. Can I carry insurance on my artwork? Not that he has to insure it, but can I carry some kind of insurance? So if something happens, he goes in and goes, oh my gosh, the, pa the picture's gone. You know, a guest walked off with it. Are you a member of PPA? <laughs> Through PPA, you can have I can insurance. Yeah. Okay. Which is the Professional Photographers Association. Yeah, for the um, traditional artists, I'm not certain if there's a you professional. Can get, you can get insurance for anything that somebody will agree to insure. Correct. <laughs> well, but that's, um, yeah, but it's kind of a association. Usually, your rates are better. Call, call yeah. up Boyd's of London. No yeah. insurance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just open up your American Express. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking of what, where she could get a group rate that was. Yeah. Boyd's of London will be group rates. They, you know, it's insurance is always a negotiation, and there's no answer to that except you call a bunch of places that offer insurance, and the one that um, you think will actually pay you if something happens and charges the least, go with. Well, that's and why I didn't know if some of these are like you yeah, know, it's, it's Scott. If you you know you carry do you carry your own insurance for artwork that you put in places? But, but we no longer we used to carry insurance. The, there's a kind of an insurance where if you, and there's a name for it, and you'll probably know, if somebody took a look at his piece of work and went crazy over it, we dropped that insurance. But we used to have it. It's a special liability. Because there's crazy people out there oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. that say, I saw this work, and now I can't I function anymore. We, <laughs> then we go, we'll buy it, and it'll be fine. But. Well, I just want to say insurance is a cold-blooded business decision. That's it completely on the business side. There's no if you have any feelings about the insurance, you're making a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> you just work the numbers. Are you gonna be sending out a newsletter? Yes. Like a month Yeah, there'll be a monthly newsletter. Okay, so, so by we'll people start. getting their emails in the I do, it's under construction right now. There's only a, a shell site up right now, but it is CW Center for the Arts dot org. It's on the bottom mm -hmm. of the of the handouts that we have. I gave Shelley the ability to post stuff on the Clearwater Art Meetup. A lot of the people here are members of Clearwater Art Meetup. If you happen to be a meetup, there's so many ways to get information. There's Facebook and there's um, LinkedIn and Twitter, and Meetup is one that we really like. Um, we started Clearwater Art Meetup because we have so many different kinds of events here depending on whether we're doing um, who we're dealing with, and that's just a repository for everything. So Shelley will be putting a bunch of her pieces, her events, on the Clearwater Art Meetup, and that's another place that you can find out about it. And if you are on Facebook, you can go to CW Center for the Arts. It's Facebook slash CW Center for the Arts, and that's our page for the Art Center on Facebook, too. Um, <coughs> right now, I'm a bit spread thin because I'm working on finishing renovations, like physically I'm working on renovations. She's accepting um, help. <laughs> along, yes, accepting help, along with meeting with city officials and everybody under the sun, moon, and stars, and, and artists, and, you know, uh, handling licenses and business, this and that, and everything else. So I'm spread a little bit thin, so I might not always update that page as frequently as I would like. So, yes. How big is this in? How large? Uh, we are 2,100 square feet. Um, the front space is 1,400 square feet. That's our gallery space. Um, we actually went in and removed 4,000 pounds of plaster and last to expose a brick wall. Mm. The other wall was actually done in a exterior stucco and was like really nasty and thick. And uh, so we did a plaster effect on that wall and then we got that wall painted and we just put in our track lights and the concrete floor is the next thing that we're dealing with. Paint, the stucco. last thing. Huh? Stucco is tough to paint. And it was just a mess. We didn't even want to paint it. So it just, we just, you know, I yeah, just plastered it over it. Every little crack. Well, that and if you just even went like this on the wall because they used exterior stucco, yeah. you just scratch your hand right up. And I said, there's no way I'm, hand I'm hanging art on this. Um, so plus it would detract because you have so much shadow and everything in that wall. It would be a distraction from the art. So we just did a basic plaster technique. So it's a very rough plaster um, on there and then painted that. Uh, the way the art is actually going to be suspended because you don't want to hang on brick is we're going to have copper pipe that hangs from the ceiling just a little bit and then the art actually hangs from the copper pipe. Okay. Um, 
it's going to be on wire. So <coughs> it'll be interesting. But anyway, so 1,400 square feet of space. We do have some panels very similar to what he has back here, which we can bring in when we're doing shows um, so that we can actually add to that space. Without those panels in there, we can comfortably seat 75 people. We have a stage that uh, is being built that's two-piece sectional on casters, on locking casters, so we can actually move the space, the, the stage around the venue, even though we have a staging space to the back. The back room, which is about 700 square feet, is um, we have a little bit of storage space for materials, and then we have a more open space, which is probably, oh, a little bit wider than this panel right here, and out to about here, so that you can have, in that space, actually, you can comfortably seat, probably you saw the space, 12 you know, or so students at a table or at easels or anything else that you want for teaching classes. Um, and then when we don't have classes going on, any of the participating artists can sit in there and do their own work if they'd like. So, and then at various different times, we'll cover up the concrete floor out <coughs> with a boil cloth and let people work out there, too. So, we very much want it to be interactive with uh, the, the community. We want to bring people in. And we also want to create a community for the artists so that, you know, if there's no class schedule, we have a bunch of artists who said, well, I'll, just, I'll have some materials here so I can just sit and work. And they can, you know, everybody can sit in the back at various different times and be working on pieces and either just sit there quietly and work on their work or talk to one another or whatever. So, Any other questions? Shelly, we'll stick around. So if I want to be respectful of people's time, some people have a bit of a drive. Um, so you're welcome to stay.